Before we take a look at what Paul has to say, let's revisit the word likeness for a moment. Likeness usually was a comparison word having to do with physical appearances. It was simply used to compare one thing that looked like something else, but was fundamentally different. We see this throughout the Old Testament. Here are just a few instances from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is trying to compare the fantastic visions he is seeing to something the rest of us could relate to. Again, likeness necessitates that the items in question are not identical. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. As for the likeness of their faces, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it, and so on for many more verses. We see this same idea in the Ten Commandments, where God condemns the creation of physical sculptures that represented the gods or even any physical thing in heaven or earth. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Perhaps God wanted to keep the art of creation all to himself. Again, we find that the word image is linked directly to the word likeness. And even in the Orthodox view, we find something quite appropriate to the discussion at hand. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. The gods may have taken on the appearance of Paul the Apostle, but were they actually human? or just gods disguised as human. Once again, we see the idea of gods coming down to earth, taking on the shape of mankind. The Greek word for likeness is homoioma. Strong's Greek lexicon definition is as follows. That which has been made after the likeness of something. A figure, image, likeness, or representation. Likeness, in other words, resemblance, such as amounts almost to equality or identity. It's important to reiterate that likeness can never mean equal to, as we see in these definitions. Although it can sometimes refer to other attributes, likeness almost always refers to a visual similarity. A sculpture of an apple looks like an apple, has the likeness of an apple, but alas, it is not an apple. Paul uses the word homoyoma, or likeness, several times. Let's look at two instances not related to Jesus and see how Paul uses this word in those cases. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Here, Paul is talking about the commandment against making sculptures of anything, and his use of homoyoma is clearly understood. It means the objects being compared look similar, but are fundamentally different. For if we are become identified with him in the likeness of his death, so also we shall be of the resurrection. Here, Paul is comparing the baptismal rite to Jesus' death. Clearly, the two are not the same, but Paul compares them by showing that baptism is a symbolic dying to the sinful life. Once again, the usage clearly shows a comparison of two things that are fundamentally different, though this time not a visual one. Now, I've taken this much time to set the stage for the following two passages. So let's take a look at what Paul says about Jesus' humanity in this first passage. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Here we see Paul use the word likeness, homoyoma, to compare Jesus' appearance with that of mankind. Jesus took on a likeness to sinful flesh, which necessitated that his flesh was not sinful flesh. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that Jesus did take on flesh, but it was not sinful flesh. 
It was sinless, so therefore it was like sinful flesh in that it was real human flesh, but not sinful flesh, meaning that he did not sin during his lifetime. The problem here is that the inclusion of the word sinful seems to complicate the issue and seems to open up the possibility that Jesus was a real human but simply did not sin or somehow was immune to the effects of original sin. However, this explanation clearly contradicts Paul's own views of original sin, views that impelled him to write concerning that particular doctrine in numerous passages, which we've already seen. So it doesn't seem likely that Paul would have this in mind, but a simpler explanation is that, to Paul, all flesh was sinful, as we saw in Romans 3.23 and many more passages. And the phrase, sinful flesh, was simply a euphemism Paul used to refer to human beings, since there was no non-sinful flesh on the planet. Paul was simply saying that Jesus was made in the likeness of men. But if you don't believe me, perhaps you'll believe Paul. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul depicts Jesus as simply taking on the form or shape of a man. The Greek word for form is morphe, and here's what it means. The form by which a person or thing strikes the vision. External appearance. Paul says that Jesus was made in the likeness of men, which we know means similar to, but not equal to. And the two instances of the word form, which carries with it no other meanings, leaves no doubt that Paul was referring to Jesus' physical appearance when he wrote, made in the likeness of men. 